My sermon today is belong and believe. Now that is really the, the, one of the thrusts of last week's sermon and I'll, go, I'll review it. And, and today I wanna just add, who's watching you? You need to think about that. Who's watching you? You're, you're gonna go into a holiday season. Who's watching you? Guarantee more than you know. So last week, Paul is in a situation, a pretty harrowing situation where uh, it's about a, a shipwreck. And this is just the, the, the squeezing down, the concentration of last week. And then when I get to the next portion, I'm gonna ask Cindy to read the this, this scripture for us. But I, I wanna make this as a review, for, especially for those of you that weren't here. Acts 27, 22 to 25. Paul is in the midst of a, a, a shipwreck and he's, he's speaking to a crew and a boat full of 276 people that, are, that, that, that they know in their bones they're gonna die. He says, take courage. None of you will lose your lives even though the ship will go down. We talked a lot about your ship, the things you trust has to go down for you to live. That's not a good, if you didn't like anything, that's one thing you go, ugh. For last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. Paul says that he serves a God that he belongs to. I don't know your theology. I don't know how you practice what the word of God says. But Paul speaks multiple times in the scriptures that we belong to him. We belong to God. Can I challenge you? I don't act that way all the time. What would it look like if I truly knew I belonged to God? Now, I know it up here. Don't, I'm not stupid most of the time. But here, I'm not always consistent. Amen? Lord, you're bringing me to the point where I, you, you, I realize and I walk in a way that I belong to you. That means every step, every word, every action reflects the one that I belong to. Now, here's the thing. The word belong can have a, a, a wide range, right? So the Solozanos have kids and they belong to them, sort of. You, your kids belong to your family. They identify in that family. But when, when the scripture says that you're a peculiar people, how many people remember that scripture? It's kind of fun. You're a peculiar people. It re- actually, the word peculiar back in the day meant someone who belongs to someone. So if you've heard nothing else so far, hear that God knows, that God, God is the one that you belong to. You belong to God. And the encouragement today is start acting like it. Smile. Right? Start acting like You really do belong to God. That means listen and obey. Then he says, and he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. That was referencing to a prophecy and a promise God gave to to Paul. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage. And this is Paul speaking, for I believe God. And last week I said that it's, there's a difference between believing God and believing in God. Believing in God is not special. In fact, the, the demons believe in God, right? That's demonology one, right? They believe in God. They know there's a God. But to believe God is putting trust and faith in what he says about you. Right? So believe in God. That's what Paul's confession is. It will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. So the fact that the, 
our life goes to heck doesn't change the fact that there's a God that is sovereign, that he's called you out of every storm you're in, and then when you receive that calling, you belong to him, and it's our responsibility to believe what he said. Is that fair? Okay, that's sort of a review from last week. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna have Cindy come up and read. This is a map of where we're at. And just to let you know, uh, at the very bottom, you see that squiggly line. That's the storm that they just went through. And I just wanna, I, I wanna put this map up there. Some of us love maps, sort of get reference. So Cindy, bless your heart. You can take that mic and read. If you, I've got it really big. See, that's, I cheat. It does help. It does help. So we're gonna go, this. <laughs> I said, these eyes need big words. Uh, not big words, large words. <laughs> uh, so this is Acts 27, 28, excuse me, Acts 28, 1 through 15. Good morning, church. Once we were safe on shore, we learned that we were on the island of Malta. The people on the island were very kind to us. It was cold and rainy, so they built a fire on the shore to welcome us. As Paul gathered an armful of sticks and was laying them on the fire, a poisonous snake, snake, driven out by the heat, bit him on the hand. The people of the island saw it hanging from his hand and said to each other, A murder, no doubt. Though he escaped the sea, justice will not permit him to live. But Paul shook off the snake into the fire and was unharmed. The people waited for him to swell up or suddenly drop dead. But when, he, when they had waited a long time and saw that he wasn't harmed, they changed their minds and decided he was a god. Near the shore where we landed was an estate belong, belonging to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us and treated us kindly for three days. As it happened, Publius's father was ill with fever and dysentery. Paul went in and prayed for him. And laying his hands on him, he healed him. Then all the other sick people on the island came and were healed. As a result, we were showered with honors. And when the time came to sail, people supplied us with everything we would need for the trip. It was three months after the shipwreck that we set sail on another ship that had wintered at the island, an Alexandrian ship with the twin gods as its figurehead. Our first stop was Syracuse, where we stayed for three days. From there, we sailed ac across to uh, Regium. A day later, a south wind began blowing. So the following day, we sailed up the coast to Patoli. There, we found some believers who invited us to spend a week with them. And so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters in Rome had heard we were coming and they came to meet us at the Forum on the App Appian Way. Others joined us at the Three Taverns. When Paul saw them, he was encouraged and thanked God. Thank you, Cindy. No, thank you very much. See, when you want somebody something read, you bring a teacher up. <clears throat> it's something you've learned. So I apologize, because I didn't ask if anybody needed a Bible. That is so rude of me. Does anybody, we're going to still use the Bible. So does anybody, would anybody like a Bible? We're using the New Living Translation. Would anybody care for a Bible? We have some folks that were willing to pass them out. If you need a Bible, they're yours to use and take home. Oh, we have somebody right up here as well. Beautiful. And, and Keith. Keith, we have right up here. So we're in Acts 28. So part of the thing that we look at is we have 276 people that came off of a ship. And I, I don't know how you are. They've got to be exhausted. They've got to be traumatized. But to a person, they also need to know that they wouldn't be living without what God just did in Paul's life. 
Each one of them owe Paul a debt. I'm just, just on a practical level, right? That, that's sort of what I look at is they, like, they've got to be saying, Paul, you're all that in a bag of chips. You, you're, you're somebody that we're going to, you know, back in the day, you don't, have to, you don't have to pay for any meal you ever, you come into any, any bar, or any pub, any restaurant, you don't have to pay ever, right? You have the key to the city in our hearts. I mean, that's sort of what you'd expect. But I, but I want to go through the scriptures and s- let's see what we see, right? So I'm going to reread it a little bit. Once we, were, once we were safe on the shore, we learned that we were on the island of Malta. So th- these pilot, the pilot of the ship and the owner, this was new territory. They'd never stopped there before. They didn't recognize where they were. Can, can I tell you, most of the people you know don't know where they live. They, they have no spiritual sense of understanding. All right, that, that's, that's humbling because all of us have been there or are, are there. God moves us to the place of understanding. But people you know, this week especially, most of them don't have a clue. All they know is they're in a shipwreck. The people of the island were very kind to us. It was cold and rainy, so they built a fire on the shores to welcome us. So there was grace given. It's cold, it's wet, and all of a sudden, the natives, right, we're going to see that they were pagan, they were not Jewish, and they weren't Christian. They were just Greek, God-believing people, normal for the day. It says, as Paul gathered an armful of sticks and was laying them on the fire. A poisonous snake driven out by the heat bit him on the hand. The people on the island saw it was hanging from his hand and said to each other, a murderer, no doubt. Though he escaped the sea, justice will not permit him to live. But Paul shook off the snake into the, into the fire and was unharmed. The people waited for him to, for, for him to swell up or suddenly drop dead. But when they had waited a long time, they saw that he wasn't harmed. They changed their mind and decided he was a god. Let me, let me run some things by you here. In Galatians 3, 26 through 29, it says, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You're children of God. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. They're no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or Greek, free, slave or free, male or female. For you all are one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. If we have faith in Christ, we belong to Christ. What did they see in Paul? Was he standing up there? Hey, dudes, I just saved your life. What was he doing? Picking up sticks. He was being the Christian, the little Christ, the believer, the disciple, the example of Jesus to these people. He didn't take the situation and said, I deserve more honor because I just saved your tushes out of the sea. Philippians 4, 7 through 8, he says, then because you belong to Jesus Christ, God will bless you with peace that no one can completely understand. And this peace will control the way you think and feel. Paul was different than everyone else on that island, maybe save Luke and Aristarchus. He stood out not because he was bigger, stronger, more vocal. He stood out because he heard and believed God and people went, he's special. 
And you could have thought like, God, he's just done some amazing miracle. He heard and obeyed, and now he's picking up sticks. And while he was serving other people, he gets bit by a snake. So when we think of a snake bite and the practical position of life, we think that that's negative. We think of that even judgmental. Nora was telling me that these are, this, this island, Malta, was a, a group of people who worshiped snakes. So that's sort of a nice little tidbit. Their response, they're watching Paul and they see him have a, have a viper hanging from his hand and they said, aha. They made a quick judgment, didn't they? They said, because the snake has bit him, he must be deserving of this snake bite. And even though he survived the shipwreck, justice, when he says justice will be served, it's actually the goddess of justice, as he's referring to. Our goddess of justice will give him what he actually deserves. He'll de he deserves the death he's about ready to, to, to partake in. Can I tell you, people are gonna make judges, judgments of you. In fact, they already have. People are watching you all the time. And you can look and say, I mean, I think a lot of Christians would say, ah, oh, snake, demonic. Not a horrible connection, biblically. But notice Paul's response. Does he pray? Does he rebuke? He didn't say, get behind me in the name of Jesus. He doesn't do any of that stuff. He shakes it off. Can I tell you? A lot of us need to just shake stuff off. We just need to shake stuff off. Sometimes we put a lot of credence and pressure and value in stupid stuff that have, sn have snuck around and bit you. I don't need you to raise hands. I'm usually a hand raiser. This, this came up when I started teaching. Raise your hand, raise your hand. But I know each one of you have been bit. That's not rocket science. That's human sense. Everyone has been hurt, and everyone has hurt people. That's common. <coughs> True? Amen. You've been bit. <coughs> Excuse me. Need your friend. <laughs> trying to. But, but the idea here is that, that Paul didn't let the snake bite make him bitter toward God. He didn't overreact. I, 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 listen, I, I'm an overreactor. Anybody overreactors? I try not to be. Uh, you know, I, my face doesn't lie. Uh, you know, I was like, mm, I contort. How'd you know? But Paul just shook it off. He said, he knew that God had a purpose for him, that he was going to make it to Rome, and these circumstances that happened couldn't change that. So here's my question for you. What do you know for sure God wants for you in your future? And, and, and some of us will look and say, well, the only thing that, that's truly promised in our future is eternal life with him. And C.S. Lewis actually says it this way. He said, you know, if we focus on the things of the earth, we're going to lose that. We'll be so focused in trying to control the situations, we're going to just mess it up. But if we keep our eyes on the promise of eternal life, if we keep our eyes on the direction he wants us to go, it will impact everything. We'll get heaven and earth thrown in. 
And I, I'm, I'm not the sort of person that says, well, I'm just going to go around with my hands like this and, and I'm going to pray that there's a halo around my head. What I mean by f- keeping my eyes on heaven is putting my ear to God. What are you telling me today? The truth is I don't know how to love you the way God wants me to love you. That is not natural in me. I don't know how to put you ahead of myself. I'm too busy putting me first. But Paul was in a position where he was serving people even after he saved them. And when he got bit, he said, if I die, I'm with Christ. Lord, teach us to shake things off. But the next part is almost worse. Uh Aha! You deserve what you got. How many people love it when people say you deserve what you got? (laughs) See, everybody's watching. And and we know the statement, "If if I truly got what I deserved, I'd be in hell right now. But I have a a truth and a belief and a faith that that one man, Jesus Christ, died for this this undeserving person. So that snake bite, that that accusation that I get what I deserve isn't true anymore. I shake that off. (laughs) And, And the funny part is, everybody's watching how you respond to snake bites and to accusations. The islanders said, aha, he must be a god because, and I I love the fact that they elevated him, I mean, to to go from a a, a man deserving death to a god is like in minutes, really tells you how fickle people are. But, But it also like, why would somebody claim that you're a god well, in our society, it would be like, oh, you're godly, or oh, you're a special person, or you have special qualities, or you're holy, or you're... I mean, have you ever been elevated to the point where people think, oh, you're a goody two-shoes? <laughs> oh, oh, you pray? When I first became a Christian, I was a KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and the people around me called me Father O'Carroll because I was raised Catholic. <laughs> That's what they called me, Father O'Carroll. Was I better than them? No. I smelled the same, chicken. They all smelled chicken. <laughs> but the fact is, people are always watching you about how you respond. Verse seven, near the shore where we landed, there was an estate belonging to Publius, the chief official of the island. He he welcomed us and and treated us kindly for three days. As it happened, Publius' father was ill with fever and dysentery. People went in and he, excuse me, Paul went in and healed it and prayed for him. Excuse me, I can't read. Paul went in and prayed for him and laying his hands on him, he healed him. Then all the other sick people people on the island came and were healed. As a result, we were showed, showered with honors. And when the, and the, when the time came to sail, people supplied us with everything we, could, we would need for the trip. Interesting part here. In the story last week, I said, who was all of this for? And I, I supplied a potential that the whole shipwreck changed the heart of one man. Now, it probably affected, obviously affected 276 people. But faith was shown by the, the centurion that was guarding Paul. There was evidence that this man heard Paul and responded by cutting ropes. And we look at this story, we look at the, the viper, and we go, Who is God trying to focus on? 
Now listen, everybody gets blessed in this story. Even the people that called him a murderer before. Notice that Paul gets ushered into Publius's house. Isn't he a prisoner? Did 276 people go to this guy's house? How did Paul make the, the invite list? Who do you think brought him in there? Julius, the centurion, maybe? <laughs> More than likely. Julius elevated Paul to the point where he was no longer treated like a prisoner. Paul says, I'm going to Rome. I'm not going to run away. The same God that saved me out of that sea wants me to go to Rome, so I'm going to be there. Thank you for being my traveling buddy. But notice he goes into Publius's house and it just so happened that Publius's father has dysentery. Is that a just so happen? <laughs> Paul gets put in a position of praying for Publius's father. His father's healed and it opens up a whole avenue of reaching people. Paul could have said, well, no, no, I'm just going to hear A to B. I'm going to Rome. That's all I'm going to do. And can I tell you, <laughs> if I know I'm on a trip, a lot of times I don't stop and, I mean, there's some, I got to stop. There's some people around that when they're going from here to somewhere else, they stop at every exit. Or some of you are like that. I, I honestly, Rhodes and Jolene are like that. What the heck? You're just going to the coast. Why are you taking these side roads? The stories they told, oh, he went on this, he saw this lake. I go, but you were going to the coast. Go to the coast. Paul knew he was going to Rome and God says, I'm gonna use every step of the way for my glory. I'm gonna see if you'll stop and listen to me even though you know where you think you're going, you think you're going to heaven? You think heaven is your goal? Oh, no, no, we're gonna have a little journey down here. I'm gonna put you in places you never thought you'd be. Publius was the, he was the big hitter on campus. He was the most important, most um, honored person on the island because he was Rome's representative. So Julius takes Paul in there. Paul prays for his father. The island gets opened. Isn't it good that Paul landed, that, that ship landed on Paul's Bay, St. Paul's Bay? It was named after, later. But it is named St. Paul's Bay. But the issue comes down that Paul heard God. He didn't jump ahead. He didn't say, I've got places to be. He let God lead him. And that's really the message of today. People are watching how God leads you. People are looking at what you hang up on, what you're able to shake off, right? God is gonna be honored by using you in situations that you can't even pretend to know today. You don't even know what's gonna happen this, this week. You really don't know. Keep your eyes open. And then verse 11. It was three months afterwards. So he was there for three months. They were in this place for three months. Wow. Notice there aren't any church buildings. There aren't any signs of baptism. There isn't any signs. There's no mention of conversion to, conversions to Christ. None. None. It's sort of interesting. God, what are you doing? Because I'm looking for churchy things. Give me baptisms. Give me professions of faith. It was three months afterwards, after the shipwreck, that we set sail for, on another ship that, that had wintered on the island, an Alexandrian ship with twin gods as figureheads. Its first stop was Syracuse, and we stayed there three days. I'm going to skip <laughs> in verse 14. 
There we found some believers who invited us to spend a week with them. So we came to Rome. Can you imagine? He goes to a city and, and believers invite him to, to spend the week. What happened to Julius? What happened to the centurion that was his charge to watch over him as a prisoner? It's not in there. You can look. It's not, it's not written. But something had to happen to him. Two things, two options are obvious. One, he set Paul free to do what he wanted. Which meant there was some, because you know if a prisoner escapes, you have that same sentence on you. So either Julius thoroughly trusted his life in Paul's hands for some reason, or Julius was with him. Two options. Both are amazing. Isn't it amazing when people trust you with their lives? Isn't it amazing when they trust you enough to walk with you? <laughs> Julius was connected by, to God through Paul. There was something happening there. Verse 15, the brothers and sisters in Rome heard that we were coming and they met us at the forum on the Appian Way. Others joined us at three, three taverns. What that means to us in the, in the commentaries, you'll see that one of them was 43 miles away from Rome and another one was 35 miles. People rushed to meet Paul from Rome. They'd never met him. He'd never been in Rome before. He'd written them a, a letter. We call it Romans. Do you think that impressed Julius and the other prisoners? How we treat each other matters. The way we prayed and you guys yacked it up matters. It matters to you, but it matters to everyone else watching. We think, oh, you know, it doesn't, you know, I, I, I'm just here, for, this is not, I'm not looking at anybody. Please understand. I'm just gonna come for the sermon because that, 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 that's all that matters. I, I, know, I know many people like that. And that's okay, I love you whether you come or not. But you connecting with other people is hugely important for you and for those watching. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, I got the right group. It says, when Paul saw them, he was encouraged and thanked God. I believe Julia saw that too. I, I read through all this. We don't need this. Here's some takeaways. Belonging to Christ and believing in God is the only preparation you need to obey God. Uh, I don't know what God wants. I don't, I don't know how to obey God. Yeah, you do. <laughs> it's, it's, knowing that I belong to God means he is the one directing my steps. Believing is me hearing and obeying. Like I hear him. I'm gonna be kind to you even though that's not natural for me. I'm gonna call you even though it's inconvenient. The only thing that will survive the battering of the waves and the refining fires is belonging to Christ and believing God. And we're in a season of that. Your, your Christian life is always that way. But I believe as we come closer to the end times, that those things will increase. I'm just sort of quoting Jesus a little bit. And belonging to Jesus and believing in God is what provides identity, confidence, and humility. We see it in evidence in Paul. He wasn't arrogant because he belonged to God. He was humbled because he belonged to God. 
He was confident because he believed God. In Thanksgiving, this is one of my favorite verses. I I heard this the day I got saved. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. If you belong to Jesus, those three things, joyful, praying, and thankfulness, will be evident. They have to be evident in your life. If you have questions about what it means to belong to Jesus, come see me. I'd love to talk with you. I'd love to pray with you. Okay, I'm going to close right now. So first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for hearing the word. Amen. Praise God. We're going to have some announcements, just real brief, right? I don't know what you mean. Do I have announcements? Here, here's one thing that I do want to know. Are you, they're going to handle it? Is there only one announcement? Oh, I'm going to pray? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm, I'm Okay. I'm going to pray for you. (laughs) That's odd. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word today. We thank you for your goodness. Heavenly Father, we we are so indebted because you pulled us out of the the mess and muck of our lives. And you set us upon a path that requires us hearing and obeying you. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you'd lead us and guide us. Show us your way. Strengthen us and encourage us. We just ask your blessing upon each one here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.